this countdown, we have the birthday. This man is convinced that his younger brother was once on the Titanic. He says that when he was about three or four years old, he was terrified of water. So much so that he was terrified of taking a bath. When his brother asked him why he was afraid, he said, and I quote, I was on a big ship. We hit the biggest iceberg and then it was really busy. Then I got really cold and wet and I went to a warm, bright place and waited until my next family came. Woo, okay, that's intense. Meanwhile, his brother claims that he's super young and has never seen the Titanic or even heard about it. The strangest thing about this, the Titanic sank April 15th, 1912. His brother was born April 15th, 1992. Same day, several years later. Moving on at number nine, we have the little girl. This next woman has very vivid memories of being a little girl on the Titanic. She states that she remembers the night that it all happened. Her parents were getting dressed up in fancy clothes. She was sitting on her bed in a frilly dress waiting for them. When they get to the dining room, a man with a mustache takes her hand and kisses it and says, and I quote, such a pretty little girl. Someday you are going to make a man very happy. In the middle of the night, she claims that she heard three people talking before her mom rushed into her room and told her nurse slash caretaker to put on her coat. They go out to the deck where they see people trying to get in lifeboats. She ends up on a boat with her mother, but they get back off of the boat to go find her father and the nurse. Eventually, they're stuck on the Titanic without a lifeboat, and she remembers it slowly sinking. She remembers sliding into the cold water and sinking down into it, where from there, everything just went black. In our eighth spot, we have the engagement ring. This next woman claims that when she was 12, she started getting memories of her being on the Titanic. She states that she would often be overwhelmed by a claustrophobic feeling and a rocking sensation, as if she was on a small room on a ship. Now, one day, she ended up watching a history program on the Titanic. That's when she would see clips of passengers aboard the Titanic. The woman would clearly recognize them and remember their names before the film even mentioned who they were. She eventually visited a Titanic exhibition in Copenhagen. When she saw the reconstruction of some of the cabins, she immediately felt ill and she felt that same walking sensation. Now, the freakiest part is when she saw a ring in the exhibition, which supposedly belonged to an unidentified female traveler. She immediately felt a connection to that ring and knew that it was her engagement ring. Coming in at number seven, we have Charles Lightroller. This next individual remembers being Charles Herbert Lightroller, a Royal Navy officer and the most senior member of the Titanic crew to survive the tragedy. This man remembers walking down the grand staircase and seeing all the beautiful gowns. He also remembers being on the Titanic's bridge. He always felt a connection to the Titanic and he knew that he was once on it. That's when he discovered a picture of Charles and immediately felt connected to it. He knew that that was himself. What's freaky is that in June of 2001, this man met a woman at a coffee shop while he was writing a novel about the Titanic. She came to him randomly and said, you my dear, were on that ship. I see you as a tall, strongly built man wearing a dark jacket with brass buttons and a white cap with a black visor. She then proceeds to flip through one of his books he had, points to a photo of Charles and says, that's you. Okay, that is so creepy how this random woman knew. He eventually went to the Titanic exhibition in Seattle to try and bring back more memories. That's when he was flooded with them. He remembers seeing himself in a uniform and he could even hear the music playing while he saw couples dancing in the ballroom. In our sixth spot, we have Alfred Peacock. Two years after the Titanic sank, a little boy was born. While he was growing up, he had a bunch of visions surrounding the Titanic, which led him to believe that he was on the Titanic when it sank. He claims that he remembers being a two-year-old boy on the ship with his family, his mom and his little sister. When he got older, he began to remember more details, like staying in the third class cabin. He also recalled that his name started with the letter A and ended in ED, which led him to believe that his name might have been Alfred. Upon looking at the Titanic passenger list, he discovered that there was a boy named Alfred Peacock. Alfred was on the Titanic in the third class cabin with his mom and sister just like the boy claimed. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the devoted wife. When a woman named Amanda was just 19 years old, she began to have memories of her being on the Titanic. She remembers that she was a first class passenger named Julia traveling with her family. While aboard the Titanic, she met a fellow whose name is either Marcus or Mark 
who eventually turned out to be her husband. They both met aboard the Titanic and fell in love fast. When the Titanic was sinking, they both managed to survive by getting a lifeboat. They stayed in contact afterwards and eventually got married. In fact, she was at an antique store one day and saw an antique silver mirror and brush set, which triggered the memory of her using one while getting ready for her wedding. What I find fascinating though is that Amanda claims she hasn't had a boyfriend because she feels like no one treats her as well as her past husband did. That is so cute. Like their love is just eternal. Like she still loves him many lives later. In our fourth spot, we have the dreams. Back when this individual was in third grade, she would have dreams of a bright room filled with fancy dressed people dancing. She remembers walking through the ballroom and seeing a grand staircase. Then she would wake up from the dream. She never thought anything of it until at school she watched a documentary on the Titanic. This documentary showed the ballroom exactly how she dreamt of it. Before this documentary, she never heard of the Titanic, let alone seen pictures of it. 20 years later, she finds that every time she has a cold shower, she starts to gasp as if she can't breathe. One time while in the shower, she closed her eyes and had a vision of her drowning in the cold waters. To this day, she occasionally has dreams or flashbacks to the time that she was aboard the ship. Coming in at number three, we have Bess Waldo Daniels. This next individual remembers being a woman named Bess Waldo Daniels aboard the Titanic. She discovered that she was Bess when she saw a picture of Bess's husband and children and realized that they looked exactly like the individuals from her own visions. She remembers the early life as Bess, the memories from her childhood, all the way up to the day that she passed away on the Titanic. She had a husband named Hudson and three children, Helen, Hudsey, and Lorraine. She remembers being in their stateroom when her husband came in and told them to follow him out to the boat deck. She remembers him saying that it's not safe to take the elevator, so they had to take the stairs. She then gets in a boat with her baby while sounds of panic fill the air. In the boat, she was with complete strangers. She handed her baby to one man with curly blonde hair while she stood up to look for her husband. Then, all she remembers is that the boat rocked and she fell into the icy cold waters. In her second spot, we have Bridget O'Sullivan. A woman named Jackie is adamant that she was once a woman named Bridget O'Sullivan, who was a passenger on the Titanic. She remembers being a third class passenger. When the Titanic was sinking, she was in a small room with something blocking the door, making her trapped inside the room. She remembers seeing the water pour in through the door. The ship tipped and a large trunk slid and hit her left hip. The room fills with water and she drowns. Turns out Bridget O'Sullivan was a real person who indeed was a passenger on the Titanic. In fact, when Jackie found a picture of Bridget, she claims that they both looked identical when they were the same age. And in our number one spot, we have the boy named Jamie. Now, Jamie's story was even featured on the show Ghost Inside My Child, which is a show about children who may have been reincarnated. Now, ever since Jamie was little, he had a huge fear of water, which is weird considering that his whole family loves swimming and water. He would only go as far as standing on the pool's steps, and he would freak out if he went any further in. His family also claims that he would suffer from terrible night terrors, where he would basically wake up panicked and would sprint around the house into each room as if he was trapped and trying to find his way out. This would happen almost every night. Now, it doesn't stop there. One time when Jamie was learning to ride his bike, he said he remembers seeing his mom ride her blue bike. Well, apparently when his mom was little, she would ride a blue bike, but never when she was older. When his mom asked how he knew this, he said, there are windows in heaven, mama. Whew. There were also other unusual things about Jamie. Around the age of four, he would say port and starboard instead of left and right. And he would also say some words with a slight English accent. One day, Jamie ended up watching the ending of the Titanic thanks to his babysitter. And this heightened everything. From there, he would constantly draw images of the ship, some containing great detail showing the different levels and all the rooms. He even knew facts about the ship that a five-year-old possibly couldn't have known. Like how one time he drew a ship with four smokestacks, but he only drew smoke coming out of three. His mom asked him why one wasn't working and he said, that's a dummy stack. It's just for show. 
And this is true. Apparently they only used three of the smokestacks but thought four looked better, so one was just fake. Now, Jamie also would be overcome by guilt constantly. He repeatedly would tell his mom that the tragedy shouldn't have happened, and he said, and I quote, mistakes were made and corners were cut. He said that the men in the boiler rooms shouldn't have been trapped. He also said that the boat should have been made out of iron instead of steel. This, among all the other facts, led his mom to believe that his son helped build the ship or was a worker aboard the ship. Coming in at number nine is the wealth gap. So there were three classes of passengers aboard the ship, as we already know. First class to third, the rich are in first class and vice versa. The Titanic did a brilliant job of at least making the third class passengers feel more privileged by giving them closed off private rooms as opposed to a dormitory type situation. But the same can't be said about rescue crews who were doing damage control on the ship. In order to prioritize the remains of the first and second class passengers, they literally just started throwing the bodies of third class passengers into the ocean. The evidence was written in excruciating detail in a series of telegrams between the White Star Line and the recovery ship tasked with the issue. So while most of the second and first class passengers bodies were returned to their families and were given proper burials, most of the third class families were kept in the dark about their loved ones. Plot twist, the wage gap didn't get any better. A hundred years later. Spit facts only. At number eight, we have ignored. So the death count of the crash was estimated to be between 1,500 to 1,635 people out of the 2,224 people on board altogether. Now, most of them died of hypothermia after the sinking while they were waiting in vain to be rescued from the freezing water. But the casualties could have been so much lower because 20 miles away, the SS Californian was floating idle waiting for the ice to clear. I bet they wanted to be them right about then. The captain of the ship even saw all of Titanic's crisis flares but ignored them because he assumed they were just simply company rockets. Bruh, I would have come back from the dead just to be like, bro, what the F are you doing, bro? We're out here dying. All the SOS signals weren't received till the next day, so by the time the Californian dragged its there, they found nothing but bodies. Too little, too late. Filling on number seven slot are the tears. Now, the commonly believed fact is that the iceberg essentially caused the Titanic to split in half. We saw it in the movie, we saw people sliding to the other side of the ship. It was all happening, and we saw it. Now, before actually discovering the wreckage of the ship, experts believe there was only one 300 foot tear in the middle of the ship. Plot twist, it wasn't. But after examining the wreckage, it was a whole other ball game. There were actually six separate tears going through the ship, all totaling 15 feet. But I mean, I had no idea that was a big enough hole to sink a ship that was almost 900 feet long. Almost, 882. Nearly there. Now at number six is the trusted captain. The captain of the Titanic was Edward Smith and he obviously caught a lot of slack for being the captain of the ship that endured the worst maritime tragedy ever, but in reality, he wasn't that bad. Smith was one of the most seasoned sea captains out there, so much so he even had fans and a low-key cult following. Some passengers wouldn't even go on Atlantic voyages unless Smith was the captain of the vessel. So for a captain with that kind of reputation to then go down in history for his folly on the night of the crash is just crazy to me, like mind blown. Coming in at number five is the full moon. Now when it comes down to blame, we can blame the lookouts for not doing their job properly, we can blame lack of visibility, but scientists believe the real blame for the tragedy is the moon. Wind causes waves for the most part, but it's the gravitational pull of the sun and moon on earth that causes proper tidal waves. So based on that, researchers have concluded that the full moon on the 4th of January 1912 could have caused the abnormally strong tide tides that move the big iceberg southward right in time to hit the Titanic on her maiden voyage. That was the closest lunar approach the Earth had experienced since the year 796, so I feel like they ain't wrong. They ain't wrong. At number four is a premonition. So 14 years prior to Titanic's maiden voyage, the author Morgan Robertson wrote a novella called Futility, and the subject matter was a sinking ship. That ship was called the Titan, and the whole story had eerily similar details to the Titanic. In Futility, Titan is the largest ship of its time, and so was the Titanic. In reality, they were both roughly the same size, the Titanic being 25 meters longer, and both were described as unsinkable, and both hit an iceberg mid-April. Both ships even even carried the bare legal minimum number of lifeboats aboard despite having a shit ton of passengers. I mean, even the names of both ships are two letters off. Like, are we just, are we just gonna ignore that? 
I don't think we should. Morgan was accused of being psychic, but he replied saying, I know what I'm writing about, that's all. He was an experienced seaman, he knew his subject matter well, and that's all it was. And although I believe Morgan, it's still just very creepy. Filling on number three slot is Till Death Do Us Part. Now, amongst the many important passengers aboard the ship, two of them were Isidore and Ida Strauss, the magnates of Macy's, the department store. As the ship started going down, the attendants were rushing Ida into a lifeboat, but she flat out refused to leave Isidore behind, and Isidore himself refused to leave on a lifeboat and leave any men behind on the ship. So the couple decided to sacrifice themselves and go down together. The last thing she was heard saying was, I will not be separated from my husband as we have lived. Lived, so will we die together. And the last time they were seen was on the deck, arms wrapped around each other in that last embrace. Now that is a real ride or die right there. All your other ride or dies, fake. Cancel it. Done. It's them two. Name a better duo. I'll wait. Now, at number two is the fatal turn. So I'm not gonna get into the nitty gritty of what happened and who was contacted when the iceberg was spotted because I feel like we've talked about that part of it to death. Now, let me set the scene. When the chief officer on the bridge received that iceberg warning, the first thing he did was tell the hemsman to turn the wheel and that was the biggest mistake he could have made. Researchers who've studied the ship's trajectory have concluded that the collision could have been completely avoided had the order to turn not been made. The Titanic was actually equipped with collision bulkhead in the bow, so had the ship hit the iceberg head on, it would have most likely survived. The damages that would have incurred from the head on impact would have either slowed down the sinking considerably, giving people more time to board lifeboats, or it would have saved the ship entirely. That guy was probably like, I made a grave mistake. And that you have. And finally, at number one is the show must go on. This was just so heartbreaking to me, but I felt like I just had to share it with you guys. I'm sorry if it's a downer. So Dorothy Gibson, a well-known actress at the time, was actually aboard the Titanic and experienced a terrible tragedy for herself. She thankfully survived the incident, but her producers were hounding her to star in a film about the sinking of the Titanic weeks after the crash happened. Like, can we take a moment? Can we take a moment? Dorothy refused to star in Save from the Titanic, countless times, but she kept being pressurized into it because producers were convinced that the film would do amazing. The whole thing was shot in a week, with Dorothy having multiple breakdowns during filming and having fits of hysterical crying. When it was finally released less than a month after the real event, it did horribly. It bombed. Critics thought it was so insensitive that someone would make a movie about one of the worst maritime tragedies, not even a month after it happened. And the fact that Gibson somehow survived filming it was also beyond them. They took too soon to a whole other level. Level. That is way too soon. Starting us off with number 10 is a last minute decision. Now this was shared by Sylvia Cusman, whose grandpa had three tickets for the Titanic. Now it was 1911 and rumors about war were rife in Europe and boys as young as 12 were at risk of getting enlisted. So to save himself and his two sons, Sylvia's grandpa thought they could start a new life in America. They left Macedonia by train for France and when they got there, her grandpa realized people were willing to spend a lot of money for the white star line tickets that they had. So on a whim, he decided to sell them instead and take a different ship the following day. And when they got to Ellis Island the next day, they had no idea why everyone was crying so much until they realized this ship they were meant to board the previous day was the Titanic. Coming in at number nine is the unsinkable. Molly Brown was one of the most famous survivors of the Titanic, and after the wreckage, she said this while being interviewed. Typical brown luck, we're unsinkable. And the woman was courageous, I'll give her that. Crewmen had to rip her away from helping other passengers and had to physically push her into lifeboat six. She then started arguing with the quartermaster, Robert Hitchens, who was in charge of the boat. She urged him to turn the hell around and save more passengers because lifeboat six was the infamous one that left the ship without even being half full with passengers. What a waste, people, but we'll get into that later. At number eight, we have John Jacob Astor. Now, this American businessman was the richest passenger aboard the Titanic and rumored to be one of the richest people in the world at that time. His net worth was close to $87 million when he died, which is about $2.3 billion today. Now, despite being a first class passenger and presumed to be snobby, he genuinely wasn't. He safely got his pregnant wife Madeline on a lifeboat and asked if he could get on with her to protect her, but was refused. All the women and children had to board before the men could. So he got told the number of her lifeboat and waited. As the time finally came and he was about to board the lifeboat, he saw two terrified children on deck and gave up his place on the lifeboat for the two kids. 
he sacrificed himself, his child's future father, for two helpless children, and I think that's pretty damn honorable. Filling on number seven slot is the bacon. Now, most passengers who died died mostly from hypothermia or they drowned. There is a no in between. However, the ship's baker, Charles Joffin, had a different approach in mind. Charles managed to survive in the freezing cold water for over two hours before he was rescued. How did he manage the impossible? Because of all the whiskey he had drunk on the ship before it went down. He claimed he was treading in the water and barely felt the temperature, which I feel like great for him, but I don't know if I would have been able to survive that and paddle if I was drunk. And it really was a 50-50 because either alcohol can slow your heat loss or it can increase your risk of getting hypothermia, so it really was a life or death bargain. I think he was reported saying that he knew he was going to die so he wanted to die drunk. That paid off, didn't it, Charles? Yes, it did. Now, at number six is collapsible be lifeboat. In a situation like that, you can very well imagine how frantic and terrified everyone was from the first emergency bell going off till the very end. The collapsible B was one of the four collapsible boats aboard the Titanic, but sadly, it was never launched. While the crew was trying to fasten it to the davits, it fell off the roof and landed upside down on the boat's deck. The water then washed over that area just as that happened, and so collapsible B was being washed away from the ship. But desperate times call for desperate measures. 30 people, mostly crewmen, ended up clinging to life somehow by standing on top of the boat. But on boats like this, I'm just thinking about how all of them would stand on a curb surface like that and survive and not fall in. Coming in at number five are the icebergs. Honestly, if the Titanic had delayed its maiden voyage by a month or two, I can guarantee it wouldn't have met the tragic demise that it did. April 1912 saw 300 plus icebergs in the North Atlantic shipping lanes, which was the highest number seen within this route in over half a century. The high influx of icebergs was due to the fact that winter that year was warmer than usual. Hence, more ice was getting dislodged and thus more icebergs were traveling towards that route. Talk about wrong place, wrong time. At number four are the engineers. Thanks to the dedicated Scottish and British engineers aboard the ship, a lot of people were saved that actually wouldn't have been. The men stayed behind and worked effortlessly until the ship actually went under. None of the lights on the ship went out until it was fully underwater. The men spent the whole time keeping the pumps running and the electricity going, which helped the crew get the passengers on the lifeboats. Lights aside, they also kept the radio running, which sent out distress signals up until a few minutes before the ship was submerged. One of the last signals heard by the Carpathia was engine room full up to boilers, aka full of water. Out of the 25 engineers, not a single one survived. If anyone was a real MVP on this boat, it was definitely the 25 men right there. Filling at number three slot is watertight. Now, designs of the Titanic would make you think the fleet was airtight. It had a double bottom, as well as 15 watertight bulkhead compartments that were equipped with further watertight doors. That's a lot of me saying watertight, doesn't it? So with all those extra precautions in place, what the hell went wrong besides the big tears in the ship's side? Well, it turns out the walls separating the bulkheads allowed water to get in from one compartment to another. Hence, the foolproof design ended up having a pretty huge fatal flaw. Now, at number two, our furry friends. People dying is sad, of course, but pets dying is even sadder for some reason. First class passengers aboard the Titanic were allowed to bring their dogs while on board, and so there were about 12 confirmed dogs on the ship. Of those 12, only three got a happy ending as they were smuggled onto lifeboats and taken to New York. The rest sadly drowned with the rest of the passengers. And finally, at number one is the survival rate. Now, this one triggered me. Iceberg or no iceberg, if anything happened to the Titanic, there was no way everyone was going to survive. If anything, they actually ensured that there'd be no conceivable way that everyone aboard would survive. 2,224 people were aboard that ship, and despite having 16 lifeboat davits that could each lower three boats, making the total 48. The Titanic only carried 20 lifeboats, and four of those were collapsible, which ended up being problematic as hell and very hard to launch, as I mentioned with collapsible B. Each lifeboat had the capacity to hold 65 people, and the collapsible ones were able to hold 47. Now, let's do some quick maths, yeah? If at full capacity, the normal lifeboats could have saved 1,300 passengers, while the collapsible ones could have saved 188 passengers. Now, best case scenario, at full capacity, nothing going wrong, that still leaves 736 people dead. We know getting collapsible A and B was a sh 
this show, so honestly, this was built in death. Starting off with number 10 is the inspection card. Passenger Marion, meanwhile, originally had different travel plans, but when a cold strike delayed her scheduled trip on the Majestic, she came aboard the Titanic. On the inspection card, you can see her name and the Majestic crossed out and replaced with the Titanic instead. Marion didn't survive the shipwreck, and the card really just makes you think. They were probably on a time constraint, rushing to get somewhere, and thought if the Titanic is the quickest and soonest way to get there, then the Titanic it'll be. Not having any idea of what that split decision would do. But then again, none of them knew, right? Coming in at number 9 is Amy. A bracelet was recovered from the shipwreck of the Titanic and auctioned off a hundred years after the ship sank. The bracelet itself looks like a gold chain and it has Amy in the middle made from silver and diamonds. Honestly, there was something about it that just struck me as eerie. Maybe it's the fact that Amy is probably dead right now and she could have been wearing that when the ship hit the iceberg and everything was just going down. And I think it's all the possibilities behind the bracelet which is what makes it scary. Was she sliding to the other side of the ship and the bracelet got caught on something and came off? Was it part of her luggage that went down with the ship? We'll never know. Maybe it didn't even belong to an Amy. Maybe a man had gotten it for his wife or girlfriend and was going to give it to her when the ship docked. We'll just never know. At number 8 we have the plan. This was the blueprint of the Titanic drawn by the naval architects department at White Star Line which was the company that owned the Titanic. Sold for 308,000 euros at an auction, the plan is actually one of the most important important pieces of memorabilia we have because it was heavily used for investigation after the disaster to see if the ship itself had any role to play in the crash. Were there any faulty areas, any super vulnerable spots that perhaps they missed in planning, etc. Witnesses and survivors of the crash were shown the plan so they could point out where exactly the ship hit the iceberg and those points are still marked onto the plan. The drawing itself is an actual marvel. It's a whopping 9.2 meters long which surprised me initially but given how big the starline was herself, it just doesn't surprise me at all. Filling our number 7 slot is the trunk. There are many stories explaining why Howard Irwin never boarded the Titanic when he was meant to. One story was that because he was a heavy gambler, he was beaten up and kidnapped and forced to work on a ship going to the Middle East. That's some Jason Bourne thing right there. He was supposed to go to New York with his friend Henry Sutor, and so when Henry got on the ship on April 10th, he brought Howard's trunk with him expecting to meet him later on. And of course he never did. They recovered at Howard's trunk from the shipwreck and he's obviously still alive, hopefully back home and not still working on a ship somewhere, but his friend Henry didn't survive. Now at number 6 are the keys. They actually did a really good job of conserving these keys. I thought they'd be rusty and old and water damaged, but they look like they're in tip top shape. This specific set was used by Titanic crewman Samuel Hemming, who was the storekeeper of the ship. He was ordered to use it to unlock the door where the lifeboat lanterns were kept to make sure all 15 lifeboats had lit oil lamps. This this was done soon after the captains realized doom was inevitable and that there was no way they were going to avoid the iceberg. Honestly, just imagine being told you have to do that and why. He was probably trying to comprehend near imminent death whilst making sure all the lamps were on. Real MVP right there. You go, Samuel. Coming in at number 5 is the violin. Sold for 1.5 million euros, this violin belonged to Wallace Hartley, who was part of the band who did live entertainment for the ship. Now, if you've seen the movie, you know that the violin player starts playing when the ship goes down, and the rest of the band just joins in to kind of, you know, mask the sound of chaos and death around everyone. And you'd think that that was just for effect, since it is a movie and they're trying to pull at your heartstrings, but it actually happened. Wallace did grab his violin during the ship's last few critical moments, and started playing Nearer My God to Thee, inspiring his bandmates to do the same. Honestly, imagine that being the soundtrack of your death. I don't know if I'm into it. At number 4 is the robe. I think the robe was meant to be beige originally, but after spending so long on the ocean floor, it turned this light greenish colour. The silk kimono style robe was worn by a first class passenger called Lucy Christiana. Whereas other reports say it was worn by Lady Duff Gordon, either way, she wore it as she was escaping the ship and hurrying into a lifeboat, and then later the RMS. Carpathia. Honestly, that is a fancy ass getaway outfit if I ever saw one, but I'm not even surprised. I feel like people probably just ran for safety, regardless of if they were wearing a three piece suit or were completely naked. I would have taken it off, you know, to be able to run faster, but they were also getting into lifeboats into freezing water, so the cover up makes complete sense. Filling our number three slot is the pocket watch. Till 2008, this was actually the most expensive Titanic artifact sold in an auction. It was sold for 130,000 euros, which is 
around 146,000 USD. It belonged to a first class steward on the ship called Edmund Stone, who also owned the master keys to the whole first class cabin, so he was pretty up there. Eerily enough, the watch stopped ticking at exactly 2.16 am, which would have been around the time Edmund landed in the ice cold water of the ocean. Now, this is a proper relic frozen in time. I feel when I read that sentence while I was researching this video, it almost made me flash back to seeing this man's arm go into the Atlantic Ocean, even though I wasn't even there. It honestly gives me chills, and I don't know if it's because the fact it stopped when he died is freaky, or I'm just imagining this cold water all over me. Let me know. Actually, you can't. Scratch that. Now at number two is the last lifeboat. Collapsible A was the last lifeboat to leave the Titanic. Not everyone survived, but most of them were saved by Oceanic. A month after the sinking, it was recovered and workers were doing their best to patch it back up. But what they found inside the lifeboat made them speechless. Inside Collapsible A, they found the decomposing bodies of three passengers. One was wearing a dinner jacket, later identified as first class passenger Thompson Beatty, and the other two bodies were firemen that had just been stuffed under the lifeboat seats. One of their arms even came off as the boarding officer was trying to move them. A wedding ring was found too, but I guess Oceanic left the dead bodies behind when they were saving the rest. The ring belonged to Elin Lindell, who got to the lifeboat but later drowned. Her husband held the ring on collapsible A till he too died, and his body has never been recovered. And finally, at number one is the letter. I think this is one of the most profound artifacts that was recovered from the Titanic, but also one of the most spine chilling. April 14th, 1912, the Titanic hit the iceberg. Two and a half hours later, the ship sank with 1,500 people aboard. During that two and a half hours, first class passenger Dr. Washington Dodge decided to write a letter. Even his name sounds bougie, I'm not surprised he was first class. In the letter, he vividly describes the ship's final hours, the sinking, the chaos, the loss. It's one of the earliest, most immediate accounts of the disaster ever found. His handwriting is all over the place, which I'm sure you can understand given his state of mind. But he did in fact survive the shipwreck, so I guess it wasn't all bad after all. I mean, what am I saying? It, it, it was all bad. It was all bad. Let's get started with number 10, first in fiction. So an English newspaper editor named William T. Stead was traveling on the Titanic to New York. He was going to address a conference at Carnegie Hall at the request of President William Howard Taft, but him boarding the ship was surprising in itself. In 1886, he had written a short fictional piece called How the Atlantic Mail Steamer Went Down. Like the Titanic, it was about a transatlantic liner that had sunk when carrying many passengers and it also lacked lifeboats. In the fictional piece, many people drowned. He believed it could one day become a reality, and he did meet his own fate in that way as well. Next at number 9, we have Beware of Water. So a first class passenger named Edith Corse Evans was returning to New York City aboard the Titanic. The cousins she traveled with were a group of sisters and the four women together befriended Colonel Archibald Gracie. On the evening that the Titanic struck the iceberg, men on the vessel tried to reassure the ladies that the ship was unsinkable, but Edith remembered something a fortune teller told her. Edith told the colonel that her warning from the fortune teller was to beware of water. Edith was convinced that the prophecy held some truth. Even with that warning, accounts of the disaster say she gave up her seat in a lifeboat for one of the sisters she was traveling with, as that friend had children waiting for her at home. It's very nice of her, and it was honored on her tombstone. At number 8, we have George and Edith Vanderbilt. So this Vanderbilt couple was set to sail on the RMS Titanic. Their footman, Edwin Charles Wheeler, even loaded their belongings into the ship two days before it was due to set sail because they were due to travel first class. The couple had traveled quite a bit to decorate their home with things from around the world, and this was another voyage coming back from where they were traveling. But then, a family member disproved their plan to travel aboard the Titanic. They said, so many things can go wrong on a maiden voyage. So the Vanderbilts rebooked onto Olympic, but their footman Edwin decided to travel on the Titanic and sadly lost his life when the ship sank. On to number seven, a gut feeling. Chief Officer Henry Wilde joined the trip across the sea on the Titanic as a last minute addition to the crew, but he was less than thrilled about his assignment. He mailed his sister a letter during the ship's final stopover in Ireland where he said, I still don't like the ship, I have a queer feeling about it. And then after that, he sadly became a victim of the Titanic sinking. But his addition to the crew might have been a domino effect in the disaster. Since he was hired last minute, other officers were demoted and one was let go. The one let go was David Blair, who took the key to a cupboard with him. Probably accidentally, but it was an important key. It unlocked the cupboard for the binoculars that were intended for use at the Titanic's lookout. So the crew, as they didn't break open the lock to get into the cupboard, they scanned the open seas without any help, not using the binoculars and not spotting the iceberg sooner. On to number six, loving life. 
So this premonition falls hand in hand with common sense. A survivor of the sinking of the Titanic, Renee Harris, claimed that a handsome stranger warned her about the voyage. He asked her if she loved life, and she said yes. In response, he said, then you will get off the ship at Cherbourg if we get that far, and that's what I'm gonna do. And yes, he did get off the ship supposedly, but Harris and her husband did not. Unfortunately, her husband passed away after she didn't heed the warning. The reason I say this went along with common sense is because the passengers had seen the Titanic nearly collide with the city of New York steamer vessel by only 72 inches. If I had seen that, I would have hopped off too. 72 inches just shows that something in the steering may not have been quite right. On to number five, the hearts. So the family was one that was on the voyage as second class passengers that planned to start a new life in Winnipeg. So the child, Eva Hart, remembered her mother, Esther, had a bad feeling about the ship. Her mother said that deeming the ship unsinkable was flying in the face of God. Esther Hart would sleep during the day and stay awake at night in case she heard a bump, and she did. Her vigilance saved her daughter's life and her own. The father and the family gave up his spot for the other women and children to flee and gave his coat to his wife for warmth. Both Esther and Ava made it across safely. At number four, a voice in his head. When Alex McKenzie was walking along the gangway to board the Titanic, a voice in his head shared a warning. It said he would lose his life if he stayed on the liner. He looked around and didn't see anyone that could be the voice, so he shook it off. But the warning didn't stop, and he heard the voice a second, and then a third time. Each time it was stronger than the time before. At that point, he decided to turn back and return to his home in Glasgow, Scotland. And since it was a luxurious maiden voyage with second or third class ticket he received from his grandparents as a gift, his family wasn't too happy to see him return. But their mood swiftly changed when they heard the news of the disaster. Next, at number three, we have foreboding. So John Coffey hopped aboard the ship at Southampton since he signed on to serve as a stoker or boiler room foreman for five pounds a month. He was scheduled for the trip across the Atlantic, but he hopped off during the stop at Queenstown, Ireland, also his hometown. Weeks after the ship met its end, he said it was because he felt a strange foreboding about the voyage. After that, he signed on to work on another ship. For this one, I would not be surprised if this person maybe made up their story to cover up the fact they were hitching a ride on the ship by working and ditching their contract early for a free ride home. Or maybe they did sense foreboding and were like, I'm gonna go home to my family because that feels safer. It could be either way. Next at number two, we have another Edith. Third one of the video, popular name. So Edith Rosenbaum, AKA Edith Russell, was a first class passenger traveling on the RMS Titanic. She did at one point say the boat was the most wonderful boat you could think of, but she also said she had a feeling she couldn't get over, a feeling of depression and a premonition of trouble. Edith did survive the disaster along with her musical toy pig though. Reportedly, the music that came from the toy provided comfort to the fellow passengers as they waited for help on the lifeboat for four hours. She continued to travel extensively throughout her life after that and survived tornadoes, car accidents, and another shipwreck. So maybe her premonitions were helping her. 